Hey everybody, welcome back to another video lecture. This one is on chapter 17, and we're going to be looking at glycolysis, so the initial beginnings of glucose metabolism. All right, we should cover basically all of this stuff. All right, so glycolysis is the uh, beginning, like I said, of um, sugar breakdown. Uh, basically, once we've got our sugars into a glucose form, uh, then we can start um, with glycolysis. Now, glycolysis is going to have um, about 10 reactions, and this just paves the way for what we're going to look at, I believe, in Chapter 19, um, which will be the citric acid cycle, um, which is what we do because we are aerobic organisms. Um, but glycolysis is shared um, even with anaerobic organisms that use glucose. Um, so we're going to go over the differences between what a microorganism and what we do after glycolysis is over um, towards the end of this lecture and then more uh, in depth in chapter 19. So um, the first stage um, is going to involve, uh, well sorry, there's there's two steps in glycolysis, two, two stages. The first stage is going to be prepping the molecule um, uh, to produce some energy. So it's gonna, there's going to be kind of an energy requiring phase and then a payoff phase. Um, and so the first phase is going to be prepping um, uh, the glucose, um, getting it through fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, uh, and then splitting it into um, two three-carbon chunks. Because remember, these are six-carbon sugars here. Um, and, and then once we get those three-carbon chunks, um, that's going to be the payoff stage where we ultimately go and produce pyruvate. So pyruvate will be the end product of glycolysis. We're going to look at all the reactions, so don't worry. Now, anaerobic glycolysis is what happens in our muscles um, when we take that pyruvate and actually do something with it. Uh, we're going to turn it into lactate, um, and we'll go over the reasons why we would do this. Um, and it's called anaerobic glycolysis and not just glycolysis, even though um, glycolysis doesn't have anything to do with oxygen. Um, just to distinguish it from regular glycolysis um, that we do. So this is the, the sort of um, overarching pathway here that organisms can take with, uh, with sugars. So we're going to talk mainly about this in this lecture with a little bit of this and a little bit of this towards the end. This is what happens um, in anaerobic conditions, and the reason it's important for us is because our muscles, when we're overactive, run out of oxygen, and uh, this process continues. Um, but for the most part, chapter 19 will then cover the rest of uh, what happens after we get to pyruvate. So you can see uh, just the kind of branching there. This is a little more in-depth. Now this shows you those two phases I was mentioning. Phase one um, is going to be the ten, I'm sorry, the five reactions that get us um, through the energy costing phase where we pr prime that sugar molecule to um, basically be ready for um, splitting in half and then giving us some energy back. And that energy back will happen in phase two where we'll go from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate um, into pyruvate. When we talk about this, we're talking about one molecule, six carbons um, of sugar, right? And then when we get to phase two, we're only going to talk about the reactions as they happen. Just be aware that they're all happening double because there's, you know, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. There's two of those molecules. And so every reaction we do um, will actually happen twice. We'll just go over one side of the branch. Um, and again, these are going to be two molecules, um, three carbons apiece. Okay. Um, this 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 table here also shows you all the little um, reaction products, but we're going to go through them individually. Okay, so um, let's go over what the reactions are. So let's kind of run through this. So we have glucose, which will get phosphorylated into glucose 6-phosphate. Then we're going to isomerize that. Glucose 6-phosphate will become fructose 6-phosphate. Um, we're going to phosphorylate that. This is energy costing. Fructose 6-phosphate will become fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And, uh, and I guess I should have mentioned there's a, uh, an ATP step here and an ATP requiring step here. 
cleavage of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate will give us two 3-carbon fragments. We'll have a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is what we want. And then we're going to have a dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which isn't necessarily what we want. So then we isomerize that dihydroxyacetone uh, phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So now, at the end of this first five reactions, we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So then the second five, or six through ten uh, reactions, we're going to oxidize glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to get 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. We're going to transfer a phosphate group from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to, uh, to ADP. This will generate an ATP. And remember, this is times two. So we've already now paid the debt that we, ha that we had to put in to get this whole process going. It costs two to get everything primed, and now we just got those two back. Uh, isomerization of the 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. Dehydration of 2-phosphoglycerate to give phosphoenolpyruvate. And then phosphoenolpyruvate will transfer a phosphate group. Remember, there's two of these happening. Uh, and uh, so transfer the phosphate group to an ADP, and we'll have our pyruvates. So just pointing out that this process generates ATP. Now your book makes a point to say that if this, if we stopped here, um, there's really no benefit. Or, or if without making ATP, without storing this small this this energy, um, it for spe especially for smaller organisms that don't do um, oxidative phosphorylation, uh, which is what we do with with aerobic conditions and oxygen being present, um, that it basically serves. Um, no good. It, it, there's no point to it unless you're making ATP molecules because otherwise it just gets dissipated as heat, this energy being given off. Um, that being said, your book also points out that you can stay warm on the coldest day in winter um, by drinking an ice cold soda as long as it's a, not a diet soda because the sugar inside that soda will basically be providing all of this energy to warm your body. Um, so the point of all of these reactions is the ATP. It's to store up these ATP molecules that we can use wherever we want, whenever we want. Um, and you'll see why these stored up molecules are important as we start to go through each of these reactions. Now we'll go through pretty quickly. Um, there's 10 reactions to cover, so we're gonna, we're gonna cover them. We're gonna talk a little bit about the enzymes as well. So this is again showing you um, that, that layout. So we're gonna go through phase one here, uh, the energy phase. So we're going to convert our glucoses. We're going to turn. Uh, we're going to isomerize them. We're going to phosphorylate them, uh, and then we're going to isomerize them again. So these are the structures, and not just the names, as what was shown in the previous picture. So here you can see some of those structures, and again, um, uh, these are all going to be the D isomers um, from D glucose. All right, let's go. And this is also mentioning the um, enzymes involved. So you see hexakinase, glucose uh, phosphate isomerase, phosphofructokinase aldo, uh, aldolase, and the triose phosphate isomerase for those, for that triose dihydroxyacetone phosphate that needs to get converted into the glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Okay, let's look at the reaction. So first reaction. Glucose phosphorylated, so this requires ATP, requires hexokinase, hexo because these are hexo sugars, kinase, if you don't remember, kinase are those enzymes involved in transferring phosphate groups. Okay, so we get glucose 6-phosphate, 6 because it's on the carbon number 6. Um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about regulation. I know I'm skipping chapter um, chapter 18. Uh, to, to get into the citrus citric acid cycle. So um, this, this enzyme here um, is inhibited by the presence of ATP. Obviously, if there's pr plenty of ATP uh, in the cell, you would imagine that, that you wouldn't need to be breaking down glucose. Now, um, it's not as sensitive to the ATP um, uh, inhibition as some of the later enzymes are because this enzyme does still need to produce glucose 6-phosphate um, for production of glycogen. Glycogen is our storage system for glucose. So, so um, but ATP at some point, at some level, does start to inhibit this. 
Uh, and then also uh, glucose 6-phosphate is an inhibitor of these hexokinases. If glucose 6-phosphate starts to build up because of another downstream um, inhibition, um, then, uh, then that would signal to this enzyme, hey, we don't need to keep doing this job. This is, uh, I believe, x-ray crystallography structure um, of a comparison between unbound and um, bound uh, hexokinase. So you can see here glucose being um, sort of in the active site and the, the, the enzyme sort of closing a little bit around it. And so what this shows is that induced fit sort of model, that, that this end active site will sort of adjust to fit the glucose. Neat. Okay, so um, next reaction is the glucose 6-phosphate is going to isomerize into fructose 6-phosphate. So glucose here, 6-carbon sugar, fructose 5-carbon sugar. Um, all right, so just the isomerization there. Now the next high, uh, the next energy costing step, uh, that fructose 6-phosphate gets phosphorylated again. So another ATP, another kinase, another kinase. This one phosphofructokinase, and then we get uh, that ATP transfer of a phosphate group. Um, this is another enzyme that can be um, inhibited. Um, this one's an important one to inhibit because once you turn fructose 6 phosphate into fructose 1 6 bisphosphate, uh, this molecule here has to go through gly glycolysis. There's nothing else metabolic metabolically for that molecule. Glucose 6-phosphate can undergo a, a different pathways. Fructose 6-phosphate can still be used in other pathways. It can even go back into glucose 6-phosphate. But once we go and phosphorylate this into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, this molecule is committed to the glycolysis reactions and to making more pyruvate. So this enzyme is, 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 is inhibited uh, by high, con high ATP, um, and as you would imagine, um, probably... Uh, uh, high amounts of pyruvate also. Um, okay. Now, uh, phosphofructokinase, the one that we're talking about right now, um, has a few different isoforms or isozymes, uh, meaning that it's a tetramer that has um, variation in its, its, its chains and its, um, its tetramer components. And there's two chains. Uh, two, two peptides, one uh, that called the M for its being prevalent in the muscle and uh, in muscle enzymes, and, and the other called L for being prevalent in the, um, the um, liver. And these are different from each other in, in minor differences of the amino acid, and it makes them essentially susceptible to different levels of, of regulation. Um, when, you, know, you may want to stop metabolism of glucose in the liver faster than you want to stop metabolism metabolism of glucose in the muscles for example and so they're they're going to be susceptible to different levels of atp and and um, those intermediate um, sugar product um, um, allosteric inhibition wise they're going to be different levels of, of of inhibition or activation um let's see okay next reaction we've got fructose one six bisphosphate ready to go um, and it needs to be split in half. And so uh, the enzyme aldolase comes in here uh, in a reverse aldol condensation reaction and basically splits this in half. Now, um, there's a, an important active site uh, residue here. The, the lysine residue and the thiol group of the cysteine both have a, a role in the catalyst uh, effects here in this reaction, getting this to split. Now, um, that... Uh, that that um, the glyceraldehyde three phosphate is what we want. The dihydroxyacetone um, uh, phosphate that's the one that we don't want, and so that needs to be isomerized into uh, to look like it's basically like it's like it's twin. Um, and so that gets isomerized by triose phosphate isomerase. Um, this reaction is a, a an endergonic reaction or a, a what is it? Um, an endothermic reaction. This costs energy. Um, some of the reactions in this in these ten reactions cost energy, um, but that's the beauty of this whole process is that these are all coupled together because there's enough free energy from the exothermic reactions to cover these costs, um, even enough to keep us warm and to make some ATPs by the end. And we'll see that. 
Um, okay. So here's that conversion, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Um, we see the, the, the position switch here on that um, carbonyl carbon to give us another deglyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Okay, so that's the first phase. So now we'll look at phase two. So phase two is where we're going to get the payoff, the payoff phase. Here are those, um, those molecule structures. Here are those enzyme names. Here are those um, in um, black, the molecule names. Okay, and we can see um, there's going to be one oxidation and reduction uh, reaction here, an electron transfer. It's the only one. Of course, this is in the bottom branch of the thing, so there's, this is happening twice, right? There's two branches here. Um, and there's also going to be some ATPs uh, that get made. So in the first step here, our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to get converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. I want to jump back real quick, just to point something out. This may seem like an unnecessary step, and, and you'll know why in a second. We're going to take glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and make 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Um, an intermediate in that process, the molecule right here in the middle, halfway there, is this one, 3PG, 3-phosphoglycerate. So you might say, okay, well, if we can make 3-phosphoglycerate right here, why keep going and convert it into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to only have to do another reaction to get that 3-phosphoglycerate back? Why not just when you get to here, you know, treat it like you're here and do the next reaction? Um, and so we're going to see what the benefit of that is right here. So this is the overall reaction. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, NAD+, this is uh, our coenzyme here that's going to be an oxidizing agent, um, is going to come in and oxidize our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we're going to, um, uh, well, there's two things that happen here. There's an oxidation and reduction. Uh, the oxidation of our molecule, the reduction of NAD to NADH, Okay, so that gets reduced. This is an electron carrying molecule. If, if we were talking about our bodies and chapter 19, this molecule plays an important part in energy production. But here, it's just, its only job is to do this reaction, to make sure that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can get converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Later, um, if, if that's the only thing this is used for, then we need to do something with NADH so that we can get back our NAD pluses, because you don't want to run out of NAD plus. This is an important molecule for these reactions, and all organisms need to start breaking down glucose the same way. So uh, we'll come back to the NADH. The other thing that happens here is a phosphate group gets transferred. Now, this doesn't cost ATP. Okay, There's no ATP here transferring it. But a phosphate group nonetheless gets transferred from something. Um, and usually that does cost energy. Um, and so the payoff here is going to be in the molecule that we make by doing that. So let's take a look at those two reactions as they happen. So the first reaction is the oxidation and the reduction. Um, here, we're not looking at the details of that. We can actually see the details of that here. So this is the active site of that enzyme. What enzyme are we talking about? Uh, um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase is the enzyme. This catalyzes both reactions. It catalyzes the reduction of NAD uh, plus, and it also catalyzes the, uh, the transfer of the phosphate. So um, you see here, this is, so the active site of the enzyme has a cysteine residue. We've got um, uh, our glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate here. We've got um, NAD plus here, or at least part of it. Here's the rest of the molecule. And so that cysteine residue plays an important part in the electron transfer to get NAD plus to look like NADH. So now it's been reduced. It's got um, an additional hydrogen on it. And then that phosphate group comes in. So this is just uh, an inorganic phosphate. Um, and it's also added on to our molecule in the active site and then regenerates our cysteine residue, and we've got our 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Now let's jump back and take a look at this intermediate real quick. Sorry. This intermediate. I think it's that intermediate. We'll see. So in that first step, yeah, I was right the first time. In that first step, after we reduce NAD+, 
Look at we've already made three phosphoglycerate. This is the molecule that that's you know that we're in the next reaction going to turn one three bisphosphoglycerate back into. So again, what's the point? You'll see the point in a second. Um, so by if we had it, it, at this step right here, if we were to keep going, we haven't earned anything back. We didn't get any ATP from this. But by doing this step, by coupling this reduction with this, uh, so of course that matters too here. This reduction step right gives off a little bit of energy. This phosphate transfer requires some energy. They're, they're not quite equal, but because of the overall coupling of all the other reactions, this is allowed to happen, right? By making this molecule first, we can then do this next step. Um, so 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate gets converted back into 3-phosphoglycerate. But in order to do it, Phosphoglycerate kinase will transfer one of those phosphate groups to an ADP molecule, making an ATP. So this is the energy payoff step. This is this is what going through this little side reaction into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate does, is it allows us to transfer essentially a phosphate group onto an ADP molecule. Um, it takes a high energy molecule to make a high energy molecule. An ATP is a high energy molecule. And so this this intermediate here accomplishes that goal. Now we need to do it again. So um, this, um, once that happens, once we've ge generated that ATP, we now have um, three phosphoglycerate. So here's that reaction. So we've now got three phosphoglycerate. Three phosphoglycerate is going to isomerize to give two phosphoglycerate. We need this phosphate group to be on a carbon that's, 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 um, you know, got a, a double bond on it, essentially, to make this a, a, a much more exothermic reaction. Uh, we need it to be way more exothermic than the ATP molecule would be, so that it goes in that direction, you know. Um, so phosphoglyceromutase does this, and then we're going to need to prep our molecule again. Here, enolase um, catalyzes essentially the dehydration of this, and so um, here's the carbon that we're, to, we're we're connected to at the moment. Losing a water molecule now creates this um, this double bond, which is gonna again make this come off a lot easier. Um, so we get phosphoenolpyruvate by doing that. So after we've isomerized our um, three phosphoglycerate into two phosphoglycerate, um, enolase and magnesium here required makes phosphoenolpyruvate. Now, phosphoenolpyruvate is another high-energy molecule. Phosphoenolpyruvate then will transfer its phosphate group to ADP, making another ATP molecule. Pyruvate kinase does this job, and pyruvate kinase is another one of these um, inhi inhibitable molecules. Um, I think we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so that's, that's glycolysis. Now, what do you do with the pyruvate? Well, in our bodies, we'll we'll take pyruvate and we'll go and we'll make uh, we'll, we'll take it to the citric acid cycle and we'll get more energy out of it. Um, but if there's no citric acid cycle because there's no oxygen, um, then you need to do something essentially to regenerate that uh, NAD plus because that is your um, your oxidizing agent and you need that or else you know glycolysis shuts down very very quickly. So um, we've got. Uh, um, an enzyme that'll take care of this, we will make lactate out of pyruvate. It essentially buys time in our bodies because we are aerobic organisms and your muscles aren't going to be deprived of oxygen forever. Um, so this is a kind of kind of a, a, a short fix. So what, what happens is um, pyruvate that we have will get converted into lactate via lactate dehydrogenase and that NADH that was there um, gets oxidized and back into NAD+. So it replenishes the NAD+. Okay, we don't get energy from this, but at least NAD plus is available to go and do its job again. Um, lactate is also not terrible because we'll just pump this lactate back to the liver where it'll go into something called gluconeogenesis. It's a process by which we can actually take lactate, turn it back into pyruvate, and turn pyruvate back into glucose. Um, and so, not a big deal. Um, lactate dehydrogenase also has, um, it's a, a tetramer that also has um, different isoforms like the other one we looked at um, a little earlier on. And this one, too, is, is what it, it does is allow for 
um, variations in its uh, inhibition and activation, basically. Um, different levels of glucose then will be required to um, inactivate or to activate this particular um, enzyme. Now, in, um, in microorganisms um, like yeast, we get ethanol as an end product rather than lactate. Um, or, uh, back, yeast can actually turn pyruvate um, into um, acetaldehyde. We'll, we can look at that reaction in a, actually a couple of slides. Um, look at the enzyme there. Um, its function is the same, though. Uh, to basically get it into a form where now acetaldehyde can be reduced into ethanol and that'll actually oxidize NADH back into NAD+. And so it just regenerates the NAD+, for that use. And same with us. We've got the pyruvate that we can uh, turn into lactate. Um, so here is that, that reaction that, that we didn't look at for um, yeast. Um, before pyruvate can be, um, before acetaldehyde can be um, reduced into ethanol, it needs to be created from pyruvate. So pyruvate needs to be turned into acetaldehyde. Um, and this requires an enzyme and a cofactor called thiamine pyrophosphate. Um, it's actually a derivative of a B vitamin. Um, and magnesium is required as well. Um, this pyruvate decarboxylase essentially removes a carbon dioxide or one of the carbons from our three carbon uh, pyruvate to leave this two carbon acetaldehyde and then um, the alcohol dehydrogenase goes in there and actually um, um, turns that um, or reduces does the reduction on that um, as far as the thiamine pyrophosphate here is that structure you can see which part of it it essentially shares with the thiamine vitamin b vitamin and you can see here how um, which part of the, the, the thiazole ring and how it sort of uh, plays a role here in the reduction of uh, the NADH. I'm trying to find where the NADH is here. Uh, actually, this isn't, this isn't anything to do with NADH. This is showing how um, we get uh, pyruvate decarboxylated, so CO2 uh, coming off, and then acetaldehyde. Sorry. Um, so again, in general, this process generates energy. Um, it, it, it has enough exothermic reactions to counteract the endothermic ones. Um, we get two net ATPs for every mole of glucose. Uh, of course, we get four ATPs, but we cost two to get the process primed. Um, and again, it provides us with warmth additionally. Here are those reactions summarized uh, with their delta G values. So you can see the positive ones, the negative ones, but the overall uh, is that it's energy producing. Some of the control points, again, we're not gonna go through chapter 18, so let's talk about them here. I mentioned that hexakinase is inhibited by um, the presence of either ATP um, or glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate can build up when this enzyme is inhibited, the one that uh, turns fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Uh, um, that one's inhibited as well. Um, uh, also, we talked about that last enzyme that turns phosphorinylpyruvate into biruvate. This one's also inhibited. Um, I think there was another slide that kind of showed, uh, well, this one kind of says it. This one is specifically talking about um, the enzyme that, that takes phosphorinylpyruvate into pyruvate. It sort of mentions it here, but I'll go back up here and just say it. So um, alanine and pyruvate. So pyruvate, alanine, of course, ATP. ATP often is a um, uh, an allosteric inhibitor for these in the presence of of ATP, uh, you know, you wouldn't need this. But um, alanine is um, an amino form of pyruvate. So presumably, if there's a lot of alanine floating around, then that means you had a lot of pyruvate to make all that alanine. So that would be another indicator that there's a lot of pyruvate, you don't need so much pyruvate. Um, 
there's um when when you have low blood sugar there's an enzyme that kicks on that actually goes and modulates the activity of pyruvate kinase pyruvate kinase is the thing that um, will, will basically right start to to break down that phosphoenyl pyruvate um, into pyruvate um, and so so why would you want to stop that right well <clears throat> excuse me um, in the in the case where you possibly don't have um, a lot of blood sugar you know then you don't want the liver to be actively breaking down sugar and so um, so these um, enzymes can be inhibited uh, to different degrees by the presence of these again uh, these signals that would come out from having low, low blood sugar these PKs they call them or, or uh, pro protein kinases that would go and actually be the ones you know phosphorylating or dephosphorylating these so it would make sense if you wanted you know it would make sense to phosphorylate um, pyruvate kinase in the liver where glucose metabolism metabolism is happening the most the phosphorylated form is less active and so you're not going to have as much glucose being you know converted because if you stop right if you stop this enzyme it's going to start building up the products um, from before phosphoenopyruvate will build up that will go and inhibit an earlier enzyme which could then inhibit glucose 6-phosphate from being formed all of that chain reaction to let glucose be present in the blood for other organs that need it let's say um, and so there are levels of, of, of modulating the activity of these um, of these enzymes okay so that's it that's the end of this chapter um, we are going to look at chapter 19 which will be the citric acid cycle after this